Uh, where does your interest in Disney come from? <laughs> uh, I, I grew up about uh, seven minutes from Disney World uh, in a Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome house. <laughs> um, so Disney was sort of my backyard and they have a lot of uh, properties that are free and open to the public but all impeccably Disney designed. Uh, and so I don't know, I think I grew up around that sort of aesthetic of fake reality and I always kind of found it fascinating, disturbing, and incredibly comforting at the same time. And so writing this play was a little bit of a nostalgia trip and, and what triggered it specifically was just coming upon a, a book by this fellow Stephen Fjellman called Vinyl Leaves, which is where he goes through and, and looks at every single uh, ride, space at Disney World and tries to work out what each space, what each bit of design says about the mind of Disney, the, the ethos, the aesthetic of Disney. And so the combination of looking at an environment or a space and seeing what that says about how somebody's mind works and what they value is really interesting to me. So that triggered my interest in sitting down and actually writing the play. And the play itself, uh, if you read it, it looks like a screenplay with these across the page directions with camera movements and all the cut to's you hear. I'm curious, how did you arrive on that form? Um, originally it began because I, I, I have this director and close friend, uh, her name's Jonna Brown, and she was off getting her PhD at uh, UW. In, in Seattle and she was going to be back in New York for three weeks and she wanted to just work on something with me and uh, wanted to, by the end of it, put up some sort of presentation um, just for our friends. And I had no idea how I would actually workshop a play and have it be something that could actually be presented to anybody by the end. So I thought, well, they'll have to be on the book. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll write something that has to be a reading. And in, in uh, and it did make sense that Walt would write a play. So, because Walt sort of saw the world as a movie, the theme parks are his attempt to bring the techniques of filmmaking into three-dimensional space. So it made sense that Walt would write a screenplay. And then just playing with that form of the screenplay, uh, and you know, most screenplays don't really have cut twos in them, but we all kind of think they do. So. I found that that became an interesting way for Walt to sort of chop up and cut and edit his own story as it's happening. So that's, that's how it came about. Uh, and Sarah, Lucas speaks of extraordinary design uh, of the parks themselves. This is a pretty extraordinary design that we're sitting in. I'm wondering, uh, how did you work with your design team to come up with this particular world that we're sitting in? You know, we're interested in creating a hermetically sealed universe. Um, and, um, and Mimi, Leanne, who's the set designer, it was very much a collaboration with the whole design team. Um, uh, Matt Fry uh, is the lighting designer, and uh, Matt Tinney is the light, uh, sound designer, and uh, Kay Boyce, the costume designer. So it was really about trying to create this, this whole world. Um, and then, you know, uh, we tried to figure out like where to locate the play. Uh, that would sort of work as a reading and then also kind of make sense of um, the piece. And uh, Lucas and I have talked a lot about boardrooms, about, um, you know, we wanted it to feel like it's so much of a King Lear story. We wanted it to feel like this kind of chamber of power, this kind of central sort of womb or chamber of power. Um, um, and so the kind of boardroom became interesting to us, and Mimi and I looked at like hundreds of screening rooms too, um, private jets, like all of those kind of very sort of controlled moon-like environments, and so I feel like we landed in kind of a, a sort of hybrid Disney ride, corporate boardroom, screening room, regal kind of uh, King Lear <laughs> uh, set, so that's kind of how, how, we, how we landed where we are. Um, yeah. Is there anything else to say about the connection between Disney and Lear? Was it, was it something that you really thought about more deeply when you were putting 
either the production together or the play. Yeah, it was yeah. it was it was pretty early on when I was assembling the first draft of the play. I kept on telling myself, "Okay, it's just King Lear. It's just King Lear," and uh, <laughs> which is an idiotic thing to say, and it's kind of not King Lear, but it kind of is. But just the story of somebody trying to control his life beyond his life. He's going to step down from power, but at the same time, it's a very difficult thing to do that. And there are these, there, I remember reading one story about Walt Disney that may or may not be true, but it's been documented in at least two books, that when he found out he was dying, he sat down with a film crew and had them film his board addresses for the next 10 to 15 years, monthly <laughs> board addresses. And there's, there are some, uh, board members who do claim that for several months after his death they would sit down and watch these films and you'd say okay it's such and such a date and you should be here with this project and you should be here with this project and then there are board members who say no that never happened that's made up <laughs> um, but that seemed Lear-esque and I had also read an anecdote about him uh, the, the little bit in the play about uh, him threatening to not give, not include one of his daughters in his will. There is a book that says that that really happened. But again, that sounded I kind of imagined a Cordelia moment there. So that became something to kind of just hang on to as I wrote my first draft. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big jumble this play between fact and fiction and cre creative license. I'm curious to know. Um, are there parts that you really sort of embellished or teased out that maybe weren't on public record that became parts of the play? Yeah, I, um, it's funny. I, I, I've sort of forgotten what I actually read and what I made up, and I sort of intentionally let myself get kind of confused about that. Um, I'm hoping that the form and the tone of the play doesn't lead anybody to think that I'm writing biography here. <laughs> but... Um, there was a lot that, I think there's a lot in the play that kind of came from factoids that I read in particular books, but um, uh, gosh, it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't remember what I embellished versus not. Um, like the vinyl leaves. That well, yeah, so that's an interesting example. So there's this moment where Walt talks about, uh, the, the moment where he talks about this tree on the property and, and um, gutting it and having to replace everything with vinyl leaves. Um, I had remembered that coming from a book. I actually more recently went back and reread the chapter and realized, oh, well, there are two different trees, and the one that they had to gut out and replace the insides with concrete, that's not the one with vinyl leaves, although I would think that the leaves would fall off. But they, it all kind of just got mixed together. Um, and in fact, you know, there was some guy that uh, had insisted on uh, uh, when when Disney brought, bought his property, he insisted on them keeping a tree, so that part is actually allegedly true, but that's not the same tree that became the Liberty Tree. So it's all kind of, they're factoids, but they, I, I just, at a certain point, I used them as fence posts, and then I did my own. What's embellished is kind of how I connected the dots more than anything, how I get from one little bit of information to the next. I, I love that jumble and the stew of the play and what's, getting mixed up about what's the truth and what's not the truth. And I think the production picks up on that so beautifully, like the costumes, for example. There's little touches of the 50s throughout. But I'm wondering, how did you work with the designers to come up with those sort of little pointillist references? I think, I think Lucas and I were interested in it feeling like it's 2013 and here's Larry Pine and Frank Wood and all these wonderful actors getting together to read this play. And so we, that was kind of the starting point, I think, primarily, was that it, it felt like completely contemporary um, and then I, I think from there we kind of wanted to um, yeah the same as with the room this was actually based on a room um, that exists it's a building up by the UN all the color scheme and everything but uh, you know it also feels like a room that could be 1965 and it was the same with with the with the with the clothes you know we work with for example for Amanda Quaid's costume we looked at a lot of you know, Calif California, like, you know, colorful dresses and, you know, but then found a dress that you could go out and buy today in, you know, Banana Republic or, you know, so it was sort of about this weird uh, meshing of, 
of the two worlds and how they're kind of bleeding together, mm -hmm. I think. As our costume designer made reference to, Banana Republic is doing a collaboration with the Mad Men television series right now. So you have today overlapped with the 60s, which is a sort of interesting reference point for her. Um, well, I'd love to open this up if anyone has any questions for Lucas or Sarah about the process or the play itself. Yes. Um, you were speaking about having done, you know, oh, I finished this draft and that's what that looked like. Was there anything that you had to omit that you think back on um, that you would like to share with us? Or is there, any, is there anything in the process that you kind of, you know, you breezed over it and you thought, oh, this is a better connection, so I'll kind of create those? Um, in terms of omitting things or, I mean, the, maybe this touches on that question. Um, you know, Walt had two daughters, and the daughter actually is the only character that isn't named in the whole play. And that's, uh, I, I felt very uncomfortable um, naming that character because I don't feel like she's a public figure. Mm -hmm. It felt invasive in some way. And also I felt like I was probably taking more liberties with that character than any other. So pretty early on, I took away her name and just named her daughter because, you know, it just felt icky to me to, um, to, to, to one, I mean, I, there were detail. The books gave details of both of the daughters' lives that were interesting. So I wanted to kind of just merge them into one character because just for the sake of economy. But also, it, I don't know. It just felt invasive. Whereas Ron Miller and Walt and Roy are public figures, so I feel comfortable sort of parodying them. Um, you know, the the other thing that kind of fell out of the play. Maybe this even more directly answers the question. Um, there's a really interesting story that is pretty well verified that uh, just when Walt became uh, very successful, uh, after Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, I mean, he was just you know, on top of the world. Um, his, his, uh, 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 he wanted his mother, who is getting older and, and ailing, to come move to California where it's warmer and where he can get her a really nice house and so his his uh his uh after much much convincing he finally got his mother to move to california he built her this amazing house with everything up to date modern times uh and within months um she died in that house because there was a gas leak and uh so walt Essentially, I mean, again, this is my interpretation. Probably, m must have felt like he killed his mother, you know. Like after, and she was very resistant to coming to California. Period. She just like, don't bother. I don't want to. And so that just struck me as being really interesting. Here's this guy who's going to make her the best possible house, really going to take care of her, and it's the house that kills her. And that used to be in the play. In fact, there there was a version of the play where that whole scene played out, mm -hmm. and. Um, the, the the in that very early version, the dog was her her dog was even a character, and the dog finds her dying on the floor, and there's a scene between her and the dog. All of that. Got cut. <laughs> it was interesting. It was funny, but just weird and too strange and uh, uh, too much of a dig digression. But uh, I removed, and then there were times when I had Walt deliver a monologue that described that story, and and I just removed it because it felt too. It felt like it gave too easy an explanation for why Walt wanted to control everything around him. It just sort of reduced it to this um, kind of trite psychological personal history explanation of what happened. And I felt like it needed to be kind of a deeper um, in the gut urge that he had. So that went by the wayside. But in the back of my head, I've always had that image and I've been sort of, as I would write the play, kind of have that image in the back of my mind that. This is the man who killed his mother. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you have any concern about uh, Disney companies having anything to say about Not really. I mean, they haven't said anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I, I've, I've talked to a couple of people who have all uh, told me that actually, surprisingly, the companies become 
less litigious in recent years. And when it comes to Walt's image, there have been other, uh, there's a book called The Perfect American that Philip Glass turned into an opera. And, you know, no peep about that. And I think that one is a, a bit more aggressive and, well, differently aggressive in its portrayal of Walt. So, uh, yeah, not really. I mean, it'd be great publicity if they did so. <laughs> so, but I don't, for the sake of, for the sake of Soho Rep, I don't, don't want them to sue. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Lucas, you've written now a play about Walt Disney, mm -hmm. a play about Anna Nicole Smith, a play about Isaac Newton. I'm curious, uh, what is, is there a through line and how do, how do you sort of pick these, these uh, characters in the public eye to write about? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, all of these characters, Anna Nicole doesn't really count here, but in, in my portrayal it does. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who are just in some way trying to achieve a kind of immortality, trying to live forever. Uh, Isaac Newton being very concerned with the afterlife and his standing with God. Um, uh, you know, Walt uh, micromanaging his legacy while at the same time I indulge in the, uh, the cryonics myth about him being frozen, which is not true, but, but we all believe it is. And, and uh, I think there's a reason why we believe that to be true is because there's some we, we instinctively pick up on, this is a guy who wants to control life and death itself. Um, so, so people who are trying to either achieve immortality or who are preoccupied with managing their legacy, that seems to sort of, uh, I'm drawn to that. But that's also my imposition on these people. I mean, I don't know that Anna Nicole Smith was wildly concerned with living forever in some way, but my version of her is. Um, but yeah, I think that has something to do with it. I don't think that's the complete answer, but that's the one that I'm conscious of.